will you give me a signal when we're ready? Yeah, we're doing like now. Just a sign whenever you want. Okay, we can start to go live. We are live. We're just. Bado. Whenever you want to start. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the third meeting of the Council on Participatory Democracy. We are connected on GoToMeeting with the participants and the discussants, but we are also live streaming from uh, the Facebook page and YouTube channel of Humans. So, welcome also to the people that are following us on social media channels. We hope you will uh, share this, uh, this event with your networks as an opportunity to meet uh, a few Europeans uh, joined together um, on the call of a political hackathon for sustainability and the environment. That's how we decided to, uh, to call this third appointment uh, um, of, a, of what is conceived as an open forum for citizens, organizations, uh, and movements across Europe that since March this year started to get together to, to discuss the use of instruments of participatory democracy, uh, but also, the, and most importantly, their application uh, for um, policy making. So, for a process of uh, reforms and renovation of, uh, of laws and rules uh, um, at a European level, and they're based on processes that are bottom up and pushed by citizens to. To a certain extent, help the institutions to act on that reforms that uh, might be not very popular or more difficult to apply, and that uh, needs the power of citizens to to happen to show that the citizens care and things can change. Um, my name is Virginia Fiume. I am the coordinator of Humans, which is uh, the movement of European citizens. Uh, that kicked off the process of the Council on Participatory Democracy together with a few other European organizations. Um, we did our first council uh, in March, in the middle of the outbreak of the coronavirus emergency. And then we did a second appointment in April, uh, and this is therefore the third meeting of the council. In between each meeting, we do have weekly meetings where we'll try to keep the discussion going and prepare um, the different sessions of the Council on Participatory Democracy. Um, today, we are going to focus on uh, uh, environment and sustainability uh, because uh, it's one of, particularly the climate emergency, is one of those uh, uh, areas of uh, human life that requires stronger political decisions uh, that cannot wait the timing of. Uh, um, representative democracy by itself. So the purpose of today is to sit together, go through some of the proposals that the people that are here, both as discussants and uh, participants, uh, share and have in their life of activism, uh, tying them to the adoption of participatory democracy instruments. Um, as an organization, we are promoting a European citizen initiative, which is called stopglobalwarming.eu. Uh, and we will talk a bit about that uh, as a sort of an umbrella concept. Uh, but the real purpose is with the discussions and each one of you to, to try and have uh, three angles of analysis. The first one is around uh, environmental policies uh, and instruments of participation. Uh, um, so we will have Marcin Gerwin and Pepe Kennis. We will help us to analyze some instruments of participation and a form of sustainability of democracy in itself. Uh, then we will focus on European proposals uh, and then on more local uh, experiences also with the help of uh, some local councillors and uh, Alain Denif from Brussels, uh, which will help us to wrap this, everything up together. Uh, the format, uh, uh, it's called Hackathon, uh, uh, it's probably a bit of a, 
uh, blinking to, to the tech language. But the idea is that this is meant to be very interactional. So uh, the discussions will help us to kick off the, the topics and the angles, but all the people that are here can uh, um, make comments and bring on their own initiatives, your questions, and, uh, and let's make it a moment of uh, um, shared uh, uh, understanding of uh, instruments, ideas, and also connect with each other because there might be lines of actions that uh, connect all of us uh, in what we, what we do. Uh, I just remind that uh, if you want to share on social media channels, uh, uh, on the Facebook page of Humans, there is the live streaming as well as on the YouTube channel, so you can share it. And uh, as we always do, the, uh, the meeting is going to be recorded and archived together with all the materials of the Council on Participatory Democracy as a way to keep track of this uh, construction of a network of uh, an informal network of European citizens and organizations who uh, are bind together, but uh, by the the participatory democracy in itself uh, processes. So that's my introduction. I won't take too much longer than this. Um, some people will join as we progress. So probably the, uh, the timeline that I had in mind is going gonna, is gonna to change a little bit. For example, the first person to speak was supposed to be Monica Frassoni, which is not here. Uh, so I, I leave the floor to Marco Cappato, who is the president of Humans and is also the first signatory of the European Citizen Initiative StopGlobalWarming.eu uh, so that Marco can kind of uh, help us to tie the, the connection between the European level of citizen activation and the local level of, of citizen activation. Marco has been also a local councillor in the community of Milano so he has also the, the broad spectrum of uh, how institutions operate and how citizens uh, can uh, can do things. So please, Marco. Thank you, Virginia. Can you hear me? Because I have always problem with the microphone. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hello to everybody. Thank you for uh, this opportunity of sharing experiences. Uh, Virginia already introduced um, the link uh, between uh, uh, participation and the environment. Um, personally speaking, before becoming a member of the Milano City Council, uh, I promoted with others uh, four referendum uh, ballot for, uh, uh, for example, uh, in Milano, when you have to get in to the city center with your car, you pay five euros each time in the central area of Milano. Uh, and this was uh, there were uh, political parties they they wanted to scrap this measure because uh, uh, yeah, they seemed uh, it was not popular uh, to make people pay to get into the city center with their car uh, we organized with others uh, environmental group and so on uh, a referendum and uh, we won uh, by 85 percent something like that uh, on the idea of maintaining this measure. And uh, uh, in a way, this helps me in underscoring how participation can support environmental measures, but also how the local can be linked to the global, because the principle uh, that we were talking about with that referendum was exactly the same principle at the basis of our uh, European Citizen Initiative campaign, the principle by which polluters pay, uh, or put it in another way, uh, the consumption of natural resources should be uh, taxed and discouraged. In the case of Milano cities uh, of uh, the city of Milano, the natural resources was space and air pollution. In the cases in the case of uh, uh, the European Citizen Initiative Stop Global Warming EU, the natural resources are CO2, of course, and the air uh, we we breathe. But the principle at the basis of both initiatives 
initiatives was exactly the same. And uh, the, the reason why it was important to involve citizens is also the same, because political parties are concentrated in the short term, in the short run, they are looking for immediate consensus. So they know people don't like to pay taxes. So let's go against this, uh, uh, this tax. Um, in reality, if you look at the long run, people can appreciate measures that are valid in the long run, even if in the very short term, uh, they could be called to bear some uh, some consequences, even negative consequences from the economic point of view. So uh, we overcome we we overcame the obstacle of partisan short-term politics with the involvement of citizens. Now Europe is facing the same problem. The European Commission with von der Leyen just presented a plan for a green deal, just presented a plan for the economic recovery, and the part of the plan is exactly to have a, a form of taxation on CO2 emission, emissions. The obstacle will be government and political parties at the national level uh, worried to lose consensus from their constituencies in the short term because of uh, uh, the short term consequences of the economy. This is when it is crucial to involve citizens with participatory democracy instruments to help political power to look at the long term, to look strategically for the future of the city, for the future of the nation, or the future of Europe. This is exactly uh, the same principle, the same content, the same methods that we can apply to a local community can be effective and decisive at European level or even global level. Uh, this is uh, one of the reasons why it is so important to have uh, thanks to the Council of Participatory Democracy, this occasion of sharing experiences and, of course, trying to pick uh, the best of our, from the best of our experiences, uh, methodologies that can be applied in different cities and even campaigns that could unite goals, objectives that could unite local activist groups at at least a European level. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you, Marco. Um, I think uh, since the angle of, of today is sustainability, probably the first bit that needs to be sustainable is democracy itself. How this process of uh, um, making sure that citizens have the ability and the possibility to have an impact uh, and uh, the procedures, the institutions, the relationship between citizen and institution is quite important. And I'm happy to have with us Pepin Kennis, who is a um, member of the re regional Brussels Parliament, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, of the coming from the movement of Agora Brussels. And Pepin is going to help us to put our lenses on uh, the sustainability of democracy and the forms of uh, a relationship between uh, um, the institutions, the representative democracy, and the citizens uh, with the story of Agora Bruxelles and whatever he wants to share with us. Welcome, Pepin, and thanks for being with us. Thank you very much, uh, Virginia. I hope you can all hear me well. I've muted my other meeting, um, which is a parliamentary meeting. You said I am a member of the Brussels Regional Parliament since about one year now. I will uh, briefly tell you how that came to be and what we with Agora Brussels are standing for. Um, while I do that, I will put in the chat a link to a YouTube video, which I think explains a lot why we are doing what we're doing. 
Um, for those who do not have access to the chat, if you look on YouTube for why elections are bad for democracy, you will find the same video. The um, point of departure for Agora is the idea that going once every five years to elections is not sustainable, is not democratic as such indeed. Because the um, five-year period in, in Belgium or in Brussels, at least it's five years, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's six, um, is a long period in which you have very little to say as a citizen on what your political decision makers are doing. I think this is something that we all are ha or have been frustrated by at some point. So what we propose is to organize a permanent uh, citizens assembly. And we see a citizens assembly constituted by um, shortition, so random selections of citizens, as a great tool to work on participatory democracy. That is because by doing shortition, you really have um, everyone has the same chance to be selected to be part of the decision-making process or the decision-making body, which would be a constitutive assembly of uh, randomly selected citizens. Now, when we proposed this to the different political parties before the elections, they were not all very keen on organizing this. To a different extent, they had been more or less um, enthusiastic about a thorough way of citizens' participation, even going as far as accepting the idea of a citizens' assembly um, composition by sortition, but none of them really wanted to let go of their power um, and give some of it back directly to citizens which they are supposed to represent. So this led us to take the decision that we would run ourselves for elections, um, which is a tricky thing to do because the parliamentary system is made as such that it's increasingly difficult for new parties or new political initiatives to get inside of this parliament. So in a way, if you want, this is where our hackathon began. Uh, in that sense that Brussels has a very specific um, setting of protecting a Dutch-speaking minority, which have a, a guaranteed part of parliament reserved for them, which means that there is an easier access in terms of how many votes you need for a seat. It's only one seat, but it's easier to get it. So we decided to run on the Dutch-speaking part, and we obtained one seat. Since about a year or so, I'm in parliament for uh, Agora. And so what I do is I represent the decisions where I um, voice the decision of this Brussels Citizens Assembly. And because I've been elected, because we've hacked this system in a certain way, we can give actual political power to these decisions because they are voiced in parliament. I can uh, bring them forward as a resolution or as an, uh, um, a proposition of law, which makes uh, it give weight. And indeed, in this way, I uh, get back on um, what you mentioned, Virginia, in, in your uh, beginning speech, giving citizens a voice. I think it should go much further than what we are doing at this moment, because for us, this is only a necessary but imperfect step um, to give citizens a voice, being a representative of a randomly drafted assembly. We would like it to exist permanently next to the parliament to give a sort of continuous voice to the citizens um, and use political tools to do that, notably elections, which is something we think can be much improved upon as is parliamentary democracy, but using these tools to actually um, improve the system from within. I think that's, uh, that's something that we've done so far. And now, of course, the, the most important is the why. And you mentioned political sustainability or societal sustainability. Um, and I think those issues are keen and are, are key even to discuss with citizens, especially because they are able to look further than these typical five, four, or six year periods that represented or elected representatives think to think of. And they are able to take decisions that are really in the general interest because they do not have to think about. Uh, the fear of taking unpopular decisions and not being re-elected. Um, so for us, having now the chance and the, the finances, because we've got a seat in Parliament, the personal resources uh, to work on this Citizens' Assembly, is a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity to show that indeed citizens can take um, decent decisions, can take intelligent decisions, can be creative as well, 
and can overcome their own differences even more than often political parties seem to be able to do, uh, which I can attest to after having been one year in parliament. So we're working on this now, of course, now with the corona crisis, it's impossible for us to bring physically together this um, citizens assembly that we've constituted through sortition um, in November. So they chose to work on the theme of housing. They did not choose uh, environment as such because it's not a very strong regional um, competence in Brussels. Um, but also for housing or for other issues, I do believe that bringing people together that have different backgrounds, different languages, different cultures, a much wider diversity than uh, you would have in an elected parliament really enriches the discussions, enriches the decisions being taken, and assures that they're in the interest of everyone in the end. Um, so this is very, very briefly the story of how we use political tools, notably elections, to show, to widen the scope of what politics and democracy can be in the Brussels capital region, giving citizens a voice through a sortition assembled citizens assembly uh, that currently is working on housing. Thank you, Pepin. Uh, if you have uh, some more minutes for us, maybe we can ask you a couple of questions uh, so that we use your time uh, wisely. I have one, and if anyone has a comment on what Pepin said, uh, you want to note down your name in the chat, we can, we can ask him. So uh, my question is, if you can make us an example of how the fact that your election was grew in a context of random selection, if you can make as a concrete example of some policy making processes uh, where this difference uh, kind of had an impact, like if there is a case or a discussion or a resolution or something where the um, citizens' nature of your own uh, itinerary within the parliament kind of proved the point of this uh, um, reduction of the, um, the courage, g gave more courage to the institution to achieve something. I think um, to answer your question, I need to dissociate two parts of my mandate in Parliament. One part of my mandate is, um, as I uh, explained, representing the decisions of the Citizens' Assembly. So when they decide, just taking a hypothetical example, if they would decide that um, Brussels would need to convert 25% of their housing in social housing, that's something that I could put forward in Parliament. Because of the corona crisis, we have not been able to validate any decisions as yet. Um, I see in the chat that some people are working on technological uh, platforms, which would be great to potentially implement so we can continue our work. But so on the theme of housing, which is the, the theme that the participants in the Citizens' Assembly have, to set, have uh, decided upon, there is not yet any decision of the Assembly. But on the other hand, um, I do have a mandate from Agora itself as well to work on participatory democracy as such. So it's sort of a meta mandate, if you will. In this mandate, I've been able to work with uh, majority and opposition parties in the parliament to actually implement a new tool of uh, participatory democracy in the Brussels capital region. This is a, a mixed commission or a deliberative commission is the name of the, the disposition and it consists of 15 members of parliament the ones that are in a commission um, so for example the commission of mobility would be an example and then 45 randomly selected citizens that can together with these 15 politicians discuss some issue that either uh, citizens with 1,000 signatures have put forward or the parliament itself has decided they want a citizen's voice on. So I think it's not as far as we would want, also because the um, citizens don't have a decisive say in the final vote, it's still the members of parliament that decide. This has to do with our constitution, but it's a step in the right direction. And I do think, I do honestly believe that by having a few of these um, commissions go, that there will be more trust in these kind of processes and there will be more of these processes coming about as far as they've been implemented. So I think forthgoing, there will be more and more of this in the Brussels capital region. Um, 
and I, I do hope and I do think, I do believe that being able to get a seat in parliament has pushed other parties to take up participatory democracy as an issue and as an item either even before the elections but even much more after the elections like okay we need to do something about this either by fear that we will be too big in parliament afterwards or just because they really believe in it this is something of course always difficult to know um, but i do think so that our presence in parliament the fact that we have obtained this seat really puts a bit of pressure and uh, also allows us to bring about the, the practical experiences and lessons learned from our citizens' assembly to the floor of the parliament and to these, um, for example, these mixed commissions. Thank you, Pepin. Um, I don't know if there are specific questions for, for Pepin. Okay, Maxime needs a moment, so okay, great. Um, okay. So maybe um, what we can do is uh, to try to ping pong a bit between the um, institutional side, like the design of the processes and the instruments uh, and uh, the, the bigger picture of, uh, of the environmental policies. Um, we have with us um, Gordana Jurovic, and apologies for the uh, pronunciation. Uh, she's the president of the Montenegrin Pan-European Union uh, organization and uh, which is technically outside of the European Union as a, as a state. So I think it's an it's a interesting angle that proves that uh, environmental policies don't stick to the borders that we define for, for territories. And we had a brief female exchange on uh, uh, the approach that uh, her, her organization is having around the Green New Deal, but also uh, local policies. So I asked Dana to walk us through the perspective of uh, uh, of environment with us. Unmute your microphone. I can help. Okay. okay. Do you hear me? Okay. Uh, good day, everybody. Regards from Montenegro. It is not so far from Italy, <laughs> via Adriatic, <laughs> and uh, we are negotiating membership more than eight years, and uh, now still it is not so good, so we have a lot of tasks to finish, and uh, no doubt the most important and uh, most expensive part is environmental policy, and it is about uh, uh, one third of our GDP in the next 10 to 15 years. So uh, we try to follow everything what is European Green Deal, what is uh, action plan for uh, sustainable financing, uh, what is education campaign, citizen initiative. We have few good experiences with the voice of citizen in our recent past. For instance, I will share with you one was interesting. Uh, it was an initiative jointly uh, developed by citizen and by uh, members of parliament, our parliament. Uh, result was a declaration about River Tara. It is one of the cleanest river in Europe with a um, huge canyon. And uh, that decision of our parliament was about, uh, was about prohibition of building a hydroelectric power plant on that river. So it was a kind of a temporary decision, a kind of a permanent decision. So it was in 2005 and still it is the case. So our energy lobby lost that battle and now they try to find some other location for uh, developing hydroelectric power plant, but not there. Our uh, Pan Europa Montenegro is a relatively young and small organization, and we try to work on the promoting of European integration, European values, and uh, through a few Jean Monnet projects, we work on a few conferences regarding uh, integration, strengthen to environment uh, debate about environment policy in Montenegro, and it was relatively successful. Also, I think what is interesting for you from our side, that we are also in process of uh, uh, revising of our climate and energy goals. And it is a quite interesting debate uh, how it will be for 2030 and how it will be for 2040. 
uh, do hope that we will also uh, threshold for reduction of CO2 emission. Uh, our ambitions are that we can also raise it more than 30% uh, reduction in comparison with 1990. And uh, soon it will be it will be on uh, public debate. Also, interesting part of our public debate is a uh, uh, draft law on energy policy, or draft law on energy. It is very important because with new amendments, we will have possibility to introduce that institute of consumer um, producer of energy. And it will be especially important for promotion of solar energy in Montenegro, because as you in Italy, we have more than 250 sunny days. So it can be very interesting for SMEs and for, uh, uh, for the housing sector. So it is shortly what we do and how it goes. So uh, to conclude, Montenegro declared uh, ourselves as the first environmental state. It was in 1992 after Rio conference. But it was just declaration, unfortunately. In practice, it is not the case still, and we, we need to develop a lot of a lot of debate about the improvement of our everyday life condition. We hope that we will be enough green and uh, enough good in that in that effort. It is as short as I can explain. We are a very small country in the Western Balkan region. Uh, but uh, we try to follow everything what is the European agenda. If you have some specific questions, what do you like to hear? Also, what is interesting, we have this underwater cable now towards Italy. Maybe you are not familiar with that. It is just finished. And through that uh, communication energy channel, we can um, concentrate all energy circles from West Balkan region toward deficit of energy supply, green energy supply in South of Italy. And it was joint project with Terna. It is from my side. <laughs> Thank you, Bogdana. Uh, I always keep repeating to those in the meeting that you can uh, make comments and ask questions, just uh, comments, uh, your own experiences, uh, questions to the discussants. Like, I mean, there is no format for the type of interaction, but just write your name in the chat. And for those of uh, you that are following us on Facebook and YouTube, uh, if you want to make questions, you can make it in the comments of the social channels, or there is the link to join the group meeting if you want to. Um, um, yes, sorry, I wanted just to ask uh, uh, Gordana, what are the tools of participation of participatory democracy in Montenegro? If we, there is something like a referendum or uh, at the local level, so which are the tools like that, from the, the institutional point of view, of uh, view, uh, view you can use? Uh, that initiative, what I, what I mentioned regarding uh, protection of River Tara, uh, in fact, it is uh, close to national park. Partly, it is national park. Uh, it was a joint work of a group of NGOs their petition and the acceptance of uh, majority of uh, parties in parliament so it was very transparent but uh, it was uh, realized in that manner uh, in montenegro we have a very active ngo sector they are not always uh, as a political uh, actors they really try to concentrate their activities toward the uh, policy makers regarding some new initiatives ongoing initiative in that sense is for instance uh, um, restriction of building of new small hydroelectric power plants on a local level on the north in the mountain part of the country and uh, they uh, created a strong pressure towards the uh, government to uh, recheck all contracts regarding new building uh, of uh, small hydroelectric power plants. And uh, it is always in the media. And the result was that now, yes, it is the case that we have a small investment uh, plant to build because they are very negative environmental impact on local uh, villages. Uh, there are no enough water 
for their needs, especially during the summer. There are no impact on local employment and it's problematic overall for the local development. Uh, so our joint work now is towards uh, solar energy, towards small consumers, micro companies, not towards uh, blocking small river with the uh, hydroelectric, small hydroelectric power plants. So it is just a very active NGO sector supported by media and some MPs. It is our instrument for the time being. Thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, Marco's point is something that is uh, uh, quite relevant in the process of the Council on Participatory Democracy. And we, I see that there is IGA and other friends from the Robert, um, the Polish Robert Schumann Foundation, um, is the fact that uh, the awareness and the structuring uh, uh, of instruments of participation that are transparent and uh, have a nook within the institution is one of the key of the work that we do here because uh, using the instruments and making sure that there is a constitutionalized or institutionalized process uh, is a is a necessity to make sure that the activities uh, get where decisions are let's say if not made at least formalized um we have with us with us mark singerwin and uh, I, I'm, not, I'm never sure about the pronunciation uh he's a citizen assembly designer uh, based in poland if i uh, remember correctly um, he participated in other council on participatory democracy so he's not a newcomer but today what i would like to to see with him is uh, um the how citizens feel empowered at a local level with the instrument of participatory democracy. More than feeling empowered, how it becomes a reality, the empowerment of the citizens. And, uh, and also if you have any experience of citizen assemblies related to environmental policy at a local level, for sure this is particularly interesting. A few of us are working on self-organized citizen assemblies on the citizens take over Europe at a European level. And also we have Stefano from Extinction Rebellion and Extinction Rebellion as and Noah. One of the key elements is the citizen assembly. So I think it's good to, to, mm. to deep dive a bit into this. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Virginia. Hello, everyone. So actually, you know, uh, when I'm thinking about citizens assemblies, I do not see them as a tool for like a mass empowerment because actually the, the decisions are made within this small randomly selected group. And I'm like completely aware of this, I would call it a drawback, like a, like a minus of, it, of, of this whole process, but it's not like a referendum when everyone goes and votes on, and on, or like in the elections. So and for, for me personally, I was um, for this reason that citizens assemblies are not open for everyone for decision making. I was skeptical about it for many years and I was pro those participatory mechanisms, which mean, and I mean by that everyone can come and participate in an open meeting, for example. But at one time I realized how easy it is to change the result of open meetings just by inviting you know a certain group of people to to, sw to swing the vote and, and they are so open for for manipulation and, and then i realized that it doesn't make sense we could have this open participation and empowerment oh we can come and you know speak together about the future of our city of, or our country but actually you can manipulate the results so th that's that is when i realized that there is this huge advantage of a two-stage process of random selection. First, you send out letters with invitations to people. Then from this group of, uh, of those who would like to participate, who are willing to uh, uh, take part in the citizens' assembly, you again randomly select the final group which reflects the composition of, demo of, with some of, uh, of the democrat demographic co um, qualities of, of a city or, or a country. So, so like, um, for many years, I was involved in uh, promoting participatory budgeting, which definitely is a tool which allows you for like a um, feeling of empowerment. I can propose a project, I can gather support for it, meaning ask my friends, family and, and other people to vote on it, and then it gets done. 
So in, t in terms of empowerment, participatory budgeting, as it is done, for example, in Poland, when you have a general vote, anyone can vote, uh, it works in terms of increasing participation and increasing empowerment. This is like a definitely something which is successful with this regard. Nevertheless, when it's only voting, you don't have this learning phase. When you, when you think about the future of your city or a country, when you consider these options, th those options, when you discuss things with other members of your community, the quality of decisions made in this open process is, is just lower. So it's, it's like for, for obvious reason, there is no learning phase, there is no deliberation, the, the time for reflection is it, the whole process completely different. So to conclude this, this my, my point is that uh, I definitely see a huge advantage of citizens assemblies in terms of the quality of decisions being made. And we try to not try, we make sure as, as much as it's possible to make this process open and accessible for anyone. Even if you if you are not randomly selected to this group, you can still send your comments, suggestions. Even uh, in Poland, we have this mechanism that like, for example, two weeks before the final vote, the recommendations are made public and people can comment on them. This is again to incre increase participation, but the final decision is in the hands of the people. So actually the, the process is different. You, it, there, it is this huge question, what is most more important, participation or the quality of decisions? I'm on the, the latter one, so I, I'm for the quality of decisions, which is actually when you, when, when you discuss topics like uh, the, the future of, you know, of a planet, you know, the, the climate change, the, the environment, other environmental issues, which are complex, you know, when mechanisms like referenda or participatory budgeting without the, the deliberation are just low quality. And so so from, from my perspective, and uh, I would recommend uh, for um, thinking about, you know, what is what are the best options for a Green New Deal for Europe or for uh, for a, what is the local plan for a sustainable, de sustainable development for our city, I would definitely recommend deliberative processes such as the citizens assembly. And as Virginia about the uh, about the um, topics which were related to environment. Oh yes, definitely in the city of Gdańsk or in the city of Lubin, <clears throat> the topics were include um, were, was how to improve air quality, and the recommendations were very progressive. Both of these citizens assemblies <clears throat> recommended that burning coal at home furnaces should be banned within five years. And also in the city of Gdańsk, for example, there was a special program to support those people who might have difficulties with uh, affording to, you know, to, to replace the, such a, a coal uh, um, furnace uh, on their own. So the, the, the recommendation was that in uh, some cases, the level of support should be even as high as 100%. So basically, it means that the city should pay from the public budget for a, a, um, replacement of the, um, of the coal fairness at home if someone is not um, able to to do it on his or or her own so definitely yes the, the environmental issues are, are those topics which could be discussed on the city level or on the national level through the mechanism of a citizen assembly thank you very much and uh, i'm gonna share in the chat also the link to the previous session of the council on participatory democracy where Marcin within, uh, with Lorenzo Mino and others, we focus very much on the designing of citizen assemblies so that if someone in the call is interested in the topic, like in deciding the functionalities of the citizen assembly, I think that is a good part to, to start with. I see Tatin Tennis wants to comment on what Marcin just said, and so please do it. Thank you. Yes, I, I would like to add to uh, Marcin that would um, I, I very much agree with you that there is a sort of a balance to find between the, um, let's say, the inclusiveness in the in the sense of who, how many people can participate and the quality, also the quality of inclusiveness as in how can people participate when offsetting different sorts of processes uh, amongst each other. And so what we are working on in the Brussels region is um, a trifold 
series of, of uh, ways of participating in politics with the right for petitions. Um, currently, if you have 1,000 uh, signatures, you can make yourself heard in parliament. It's a right, so you can enforce it. But you will, it's very unilateral, and it's only among people that agree with something that you want to put forward. So it's, it's in a way, it's very classical. Then you have these uh, mixed commissions, which I talked about. So it's really the deliberative process in which people will discuss uh, between politicians and um, uh, randomly selected citizens. And then a third aspect is um, the um, aspect that does not exist yet, but of a referendum in Brussels. And what we will propose in um, the regional parliament um, is going to be a, um, a mixed system where you have um, a vote by all citizens involved, um, as from 16 years old, we're going to propose. But before you have a vote, you have a panel of citizens that are drafted and that will generate an information brochure or an information pamphlet with um, uh, arguments for and against the question of the um, of the referendum so that people can make an informed decision. Because often in referendums, you've got a lot of misinformation or disinformation uh, to kind of tackle that. And I think apart from the different qualities, it also depends on the question you want to have answered. I think it's a, if it's an open question, a deliberative mm. process can be very interesting because, of course, you will um, discuss and, and be creative and come about with new proposals. Whereas if it's a closed question, should we yes or no do this, then a referendum can be interesting, but it should be a qualitative process just as well uh, to avoid disinformation um, and misinformation. Um, mm. So I just wanted to add that to your, um, to your thoughts, which I thought were very valuable. Thank yes. you. Yes, you. Uh, you know, uh, I'm aware of the uh, Citizens uh, Initiative Review uh, from Oregon, and definitely this is a step to improve the quality of referendums. Nevertheless, you know, consider um, a citizens assembly, which takes like uh, seven days, or in other words, like 30 or 40 hours, and a one page brochure, which they do in Oregon. I think there is a qualitative difference. So uh, I also agree that there is a huge value in referendum in terms of a participation. But every yes, it was our we collective lost. decision. Yes, yes. We, we lost the last seconds. I okay. think. Okay. So, um, um, I see a huge like um, value in referendum, which allow you to have uh, this open participation for everyone. This is empowering, definitely. Nevertheless, there is this trade-off, uh, and I don't see it as a balance, but as a trade-off in decisions made in this um, way when everyone just goes and vote. Because um, the, from my perspective, if you would like to really go deep into the subject, it just takes hours and hours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Malcin. Um, maybe, Malcin, yeah. sorry, if I, maybe more than a trade-off, uh, the two processes are dealing with a different stage in a way because, um, for example, in Ireland, there was this uh, citizen assembly who then brought referendum on uh, gay marriage or abortion. And uh, the citizen assembly phase was a precedent phase, a previous phase, where the issue was discuss it as you said with uh, in, a, in a more in depth with an in-depth analysis of the pro and cons and all the different aspects and so on and then the referendum came out and the referendum was a later on phase by which every and each citizen was confronted with uh, uh, a clear-cut choice um, which, of course, is a simplification, but I, I see, I mean, politics is also about simplification. So I would, uh, uh, there are moments in which the two things could uh, be in conflict, but there is a wide margin to create them in a synergic and complementary way. Yes, Marco, definitely uh, the experience from Ireland is that the uh, discussions uh, made in, through the Citizens' Assembly contributed uh, also to this change of the of the law. 
but just I think it's worth clarifying that those referenda were obligatory. In Ireland, it is the case, if you would like to change the constitution, you just must have a referendum. There's no way, other way around it. In Poland, on the other hand, if you would like to change the constitution, it goes through the parliament and referendum is illegal. So it's, a, it's a, just a different country. Mm -hmm. Um, whilst we move forward, uh, again, I try to refer back to the previous council and the recording uh, because uh, there are lines that we try to draw with this forum that we have. And for example, um, one of the topics of last session was information. We had Bruno Kaufmann, which is the global democracy um, correspondent of the Swiss public broadcaster. And I recommend everyone, not now because you will leave this meeting, but to, to, to watch the, his contribution because I think the Swiss model of information is quite interesting. Uh, ultimately, all these participatory democracy processes brings a shaking in the public sphere. They bring a topic into a debate that becomes part of the uh, collective thinking. Uh, and uh, what happens in um, Switzerland, for example, is that they send out the brochure for each referendum day but I found quite relevant the fact that, for example, newsrooms and the media, they have some dedicated moments where they study the issue that is under referendum and the journalists themselves need to discuss among them, come up with the pros and cons, and this then informs the um, informative process from a, a journalistic perspective. So I think the beauty of these instruments, and probably we should have a council on participatory democracy just about uh, information and public sphere, but uh, the way I think it's interesting to look with the angles of, uh, with the lenses of like uh, how the collective political conscience is formed uh, among citizens and the, uh, and the dialogue in itself. Um, let's, uh, if we agree, move to, to the next discussant. Uh, and of course, again, uh, feel free to jump in or at least write in the chat if you want to, to bring your own comment. Um, we have uh, with us, uh, sorry, I'm bad with names, uh, Cornelia Flor Florina German. Uh, she's in the a board member of Volt Europa, and uh, we decided that she will join us just yesterday when she sent us an open letter that she and others are working on about waste management in Eastern European countries, uh, uh, sorry, air pollution in Eastern European countries. So I ask uh, um, Cornelia to bring her experience here at the Council on Participatory Democracy uh, so that we can put it on the table and maybe uh, see how this could uh, merge with other initiatives, share some ideas, and uh, maybe tie it also to stop global warming of you if uh, there is a chance. So. Welcome with us, um, Corina. Very close, yeah. Sorry, Cornelia. I just made a mix of your name. Hello, everybody, and thank you, thank you, Virginia, and uh, thank you, everybody, for um, inviting me. Uh, I'm I'm really happy to be here, and I, I saw that in the last meeting we have met one of my colleagues from Volt Europa, which is Paul Loper. So um, um, now we <laughs> have a connection. Um, so Volt Europa, maybe you know about it, it's a pan-European political movement, which is present in 32 countries around Europe. Um, but I'm here not as a representative of Volt Europa, which I'm a board member, as you said, but um, an initiative, a citizen's initiative that started in Romania about um, two months ago, when um, we gathered um, about 38 organizations in Romania to to ask the government uh, to do something about air pollution because we have a huge problem with waste management. We um, we do not manage to collect the waste separately. So um, basically, all almost all our uh, waste gets to be burned in, um, in, in the air, just on, on the fields. So um, this is very um, damaging for, for people's health. And here I can send you the, um, the open letter that we are intending to, uh, we intend to send to the um, European Commission. Um, oh, I sent it one moment. So I can send it to everyone. 
So we are asking um, for regulations because the main problem is not that we don't have uh, legislation, but is that the legislation can be um, can be uh, went around. So um, we don't have um, air quality uh, monitoring. Um, um, how, how to say? Um, yeah, basically we can we cannot. Um, we cannot measure the air quality parameters because um, there is a lack of a number of uh, sensors. So um, we would like to to get the, um, the support from all the European organizations. We already have the signature from WWF. Um, Zero Waste is um, on the way to co-signing this and uh, we are we're well, very happy if uh, unions can support us and yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, um, can you open the letter? Um, I, can, I can tell you a bit more about it. So our main two points in this letter are um, solving the um, um, waste management problem because we also import waste from the Western Europe. Um, and uh, it gets to be co-incinerated or it ends up again in the land piece. So, um, waste management, uh, circular economy and uh, air quality monitoring are our main um, requests. Thank you, Cornelia, for sharing with us and so first of all, the good thing of the council is that you have people from multiple organizations and uh, citizens at the same time. So um, everyone can look at this and see how this fits uh, into the into the society. My question is, uh, um, you are writing to the European Commission, right? The open letter. Um, are you also finding some hooks in Romania from a political perspective? like? How we are trying to bring the case, uh, like how is the relationship between the Romanian situation, neighborhood states, and the Commission? How how you decided to target the Commission with the letter? Um, I, I'm not sure if I understand right your question, but the, um, the, the letter is also addressing um, on behalf of the other um, countries on Eastern Europe, which are um, Bulgaria and Ukraine and Poland, where the same thing happens. So um, it, I think it's important to solve this problem in, in this area because uh, we are not aligned with the rest of Europe. And um, it, it's difficult to make this alignment without having a separate strategic plan for it. So I think we need help from, from the Commission and we need help from European institutions because in inside uh, uh, we cannot do it ourselves, it's just what we have understood. Our, uh, we have received, uh, because first we sent this letter to our government and our president, we have received um, an answer that is not satisfactory, so um, that's why we need to go uh, one level up. Does this answer your question? That I, I have a suggestion, but I don't want to take all the time, so I leave some moments of silence just because. Um, but uh, I think one idea could be for you as well to um, submit it as a petition to the European Parliament. Uh, through there is a official channel of petitioning the Parliament. Technically, is right to petition. I think um, we used it uh, as an outcome of, and I tell for, for everyone joining, as an outcome of the first Council on Participatory Democracy. We came up with a petition to the Parliament on the management of the coronavirus crisis, as well as uh, um, social, economic, and climate crises. And uh, the petition is a good instrument because it brings your voice, I mean, you probably know, but I suggest beside the open letter, transform it into an institutional hook. Uh, it's also a way to create a connection within the parliament, plus vault as a member of the parliament, uh, 
there, so maybe this can help as well. But I think using the oh, using the instrument uh, helps to increase the um, the impact that uh, that you, you can have. So uh, and probably as a shared knowledge for all of us in the council, um, I think encouraging each other to, to to use these channels can help us to make the most of what the European Union provides somehow in terms of uh, of uh, of rights. So that we can discuss this further if you want to. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I think this is a great idea. And um, so we need to see the next steps after we send the open letters. So um, we will be happy to discuss further with you and get your input. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cornelia. OK, I don't see other people who want to ask questions or comments. So um, we do have with us Ilaria Galeb from uh, uh, from change for the planet so thanks for joining us Ilaria uh, um, so I think the floor is yours to bring us your perspective on uh, activism participatory democracy local and uh, European levels for the climate action so welcome and thanks for being with us uh, I hope you can turn on the webcam and the microphone hope so uh, If there are some technical problems, I can uh, say a word maybe, but first let's see if Ilaria will Bye -bye, be... Lawrence. You go, I'll chat with Ilaria. Okay, great. Now maybe just to underline quickly the link between uh, uh, what the campaign uh, that we are running as uh, humans at uh, the European level and this event, which is specifically local. Uh, the two things are really in touch I think because we know that nowadays probably the local level is still the only one in which uh, democracy seems not to be in a crisis. We know all the surveys and studies telling us that electoral democracy is becoming more and more something in which people don't believe in. Uh, less and less people go voting and all those things that, that we know. Uh, at the same time, the local level uh, mayors and uh, uh, administration at the local level are still something in which some people believe in uh, and maybe some people can perceive what uh, politic, uh, politics can do at the local level. So uh, it would be a very powerful uh, tool to have this uh, ongoing campaign uh, which is called Stop Global Warming, uh, um, which is asking uh, at the European Commission to introduce a price for carbon, uh, receiving maybe some help also from local uh, administration uh, and local activists, of course, not necessarily administrations, uh, in support for this campaign could be a way to say uh, in a moment in which um, the, the intergovernmental Europe seems to be uh, still uh, stuck in, inside this debate and uh, un locked in this in this debate. Let's say a push can can come from the initiative of uh, local activists and uh, let's say of the Europe uh, of mayors and the local administrators. So uh, this is just a, a suggestion. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I hope that we can find a way to link somehow all these very interesting experience at the local level that you are telling us and also the, the campaign that we are running as uh, humans in this moment. Thank you, Lorenzo. I think in the meantime, Ilaria sorted her problems with the... Yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hello, welcome. good evening. I'm Ilaria Galeb, a co-founder of uh, Change for Planet, which is uh, an association of uh, only young people uh, who come from all over Italy. And uh, we met uh, in the organization of uh, Elco Italia, which is the local conference uh, of youth on climate change. Um, and uh, we decided that uh, 
the team spirit was too strong to limit ourselves to this. So we are currently in uh, contact with uh, various associ associations and uh, we are part of uh, the Osservatorio della Sostenibilità uh, with Extinction Rebellion and uh, Lega Ambiente, uh, Italian Climate Network. So um, we have the aim to uh, keep the young part uh, informed and to create a network of uh, people with the same goal. So today I'm here more than anything else to learn from you and uh, bring back what uh, you're saying to the young Italians. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Laria. Do you want maybe to tell us uh, which type of actions you did so far? Like uh, if something that uh, uh, you brought on uh, kind of worked, uh, uh, how we are trying to have a change that is not only advocacy, but also uh, impact in how things work. And uh, maybe you can share some experiences or stuff that you tried and didn't work. Like, I think it's good to know from each other um, these sort of things. Yes, yeah, so we started in uh, September, October with uh, uh, the local conference of youth uh, and uh, we had uh, lots of uh, Italian activists and uh, experts uh, in um, many fields. So um, like agriculture, like, um, um, I don't know, lots of fields. Uh, also Andrea Salimbeni. Uh, and uh, we took out uh, this um, 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 mm, proposed <laughs> uh, and uh, we uh, we took it to the European Parliament, to the COP, uh, to the um, uh, uh, Italian Parliament, and also in Florence, in the Florence city. Uh, so we started uh, uh, with the um, uh, opinions of uh, all uh, the all the young people who came in El Coy, and then uh, uh, we worked on it. Uh, we worked on it a lot. So now we are going to improve improve this, and this is uh, our um, aim now. Thank you, Ilaria. Malcolm. No, I saw a hand. Okay, cool. Okay, so next on stage is Cesari from the International Logic Movement. Uh, he would like to share the screen, so let's give him a second. Because you don't know, but Cesari is the second meeting that he joins and he's talking us about this platform for making our life better. And so I asked him to show it to us so that we can all see it. So, so that you should see the ability to see. Hey, uh, so yeah. There is a, tr a tremendous amount of information to get across here. Um, so this is really a whole new system of democracy. It makes uh, politics rational, efficient, and incorruptible. I call it intelligent democracy. Um, there's a lot to that. Uh, but so this system consists of two parts. And uh, one of those parts is a new political party. It's called the International Logic Party. The party does not represent any ideas and it never will. Instead, the party uses a new networking platform to organize itself. Uh, that's called Igora, the worldwide stock market of ideas. And the purpose of this platform is to really scale the dynamics of a citizen democracy to unlimited size. And that's what it does. It does it marvelously well. But it also actually turns people into political philosophers. It makes people more rational, uh, more informed. Uh, and so the way that people uh, participate is by actually each person developing their own ideological profile out of various ideas. Um, we show which ideas are most strongly supported by the people. 
and then we uh, are able to algorithmically create a list of political candidates who most closely represent the public will. Um, <laughs> you probably have a thousand questions, as you should, about that. Frankly, the easiest way to appreciate that, to understand it, to, and to test it is just to use it. But I want to walk you through very quickly through the interfaces of, of Igora as it is um, right now. Of course, keep in mind, this is still a I mean, the platform itself, it's enough to start a revolution in most countries around the world, but <clears throat> there are still many things that we uh, need to be developing. So this is Igora. It has a Greek theme to it because a lot of the solutions to the problems of the system came from Greek philosophy. This is really the realization of Plato's Republic. Um, so uh, registration and login is very simple. I'm going to go ahead and log in here. Um, this shows you how many users there are of Igora, how many of those users are International Logic Party members, because Igora is open to everybody. Um, and this shows you how many, uh, or what are the different nations of the members of the International Logic Party. There's a lot to explain here, but I'm just going to go through it very quickly. This here, this is the home screen, and this is where each and any person develops their own political philosophy out of various ideas. This is my ideological profile with all kinds of different ideas. Now, uh, two main things about it, the, the structure of the ideological profile, you can have universal ideas or you can have national ideas. Uh, national ideas can only be shared by members of your nation. Um, now, there are all kinds of ideas here. This is my fundamental philosophy. This is my uh, idea about animal liberation, which is my most important practical idea. This is about a theory of land ownership, border control, about economics, social issues, all kinds of things, universal basic income, criminal justice system reform. But there is a structure to this. These ideas go from 23 points down to one uh, in descending order. And with these point positions, the user is actually assigning points to these ideas. And so like this idea, I give it 23 points, but it actually has 57 points from all of the different users. Uh, this idea here, for example, I give it 15 points, but it has 222 points. Now, uh, this information comes together here on the indexes screen where you can generate an index for any, uh, well, any community. So you can look at all ideas from all nations as well as universal ideas. So this is the number one idea in the world right now with 222 points, 12 supporters. Uh, this is the number two idea and so on. It's all kinds of ideas, all of these. And now many of these ideas are contradictory to one another, so they are competing against one another. But you also have similar ideas that are different versions uh, of a, sim a similar idea that are also competing against one another. Now again, uh, this is the campaigns function, which at this stage is very fundamental, uh, very rudimentary. Uh, but over here, you can create a list of political candidates. Currently, Cynthia Leonard, she is our candidate for president of the USA. Um, she's really serving a functional role just to kind of mobilize people, give, uh, give people someone to challenge. That's, that's really her role. She's not really expecting to be president. If I wanted to, I could declare myself as a candidate, and then I could regenerate the list for USA. And so here, I'm actually in first place. Not that I actually want to be president of the USA either. Uh, but really, the most important part uh, is our citizen assembly meetings, because this, like I said, the purpose of this platform is to actually scale the dynamics of a citizen democracy. So this is all about people coming together to deliberate about any and each of these ideas, whatever is interesting to somebody, and to, well, to learn from one another. Uh, it's really a citizen lobby session. It's where a citizen has an opportunity uh, to meet with other um to other citizens, I'm trying to stop sharing the screen. I'm not okay. Uh, it's an opportunity for citizens to come together, present their best ideas to one another, and solicit the support uh, of other citizens for what they think are best ideas. Through that, uh, through that process, we all get uh, more informed, uh, smarter in general. There is a tremendous amount to it, but I'd like to invite every one of you to our citizen assembly. We organize them every Thursday and Sunday. Uh, well, actually, we have a lot more citizen assemblies. The Thursday and Sunday ones are intended to be like an introductory uh, meeting for anyone. But then we have breakout sessions for somebody who wants to discuss a specific idea, whatever that may be, about something about economics, some social issue. They could have a breakout session 
and uh, whoever is interested in discussing that topic for it or against it, they can discuss that, as well as organizing other meetings at some other times that fit their schedule better. So this is a tool that completely gives power to the people. It's uh, it's just a matter. We're slowly working on taking control of all the governments in the world. So come and join us. Thank you. Thank you, Shazali. Thanks for showing the platform. And uh, uh, as for the other discussions, if you guys have any personal comment, we keep moving. Uh, just keep in mind that uh, toward five, we will have uh, the presence of Lorenzo Lipparini from Comune di Milano uh, in Italy uh, to focus on the type of processes that the municipality is, uh, is the Council on Participatory Democracy, open data and civic engagement. So it's going to share with us some experiences of uh, um, the local municipality of Milano, also with regards to the action plan uh, for the post-coronavirus crisis, which of course is tied to the topics of sustainability uh, as well. Um, and Alain Denis from the um, um, Salon of European Civic Organization and the author of our book about the future of Brussels. So, uh, at five, we will have them. In the meantime, uh, we can keep this going. And I see that we have Professor Rodolfo Levanski with us. Uh, he teaches uh, social and political sciences at the University of Bologna in Italy. And uh, uh, we met again talking about citizen assemblies. But maybe uh, if he wants to say something about the general topic of the um, council of today, I think each angle is important. So maybe also based on what we discussed so far. Uh, that's an option, or Stefano from Extinction Rebellion, or I mean, we have a few people connected, so feel free to talk. <laughs> uh, one second, Professor Levanski, since he cannot. Right. So can you try now, maybe? Oh, hello, hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, it works. Uh, hello, Virginia. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, I saw your email too late, Virginia. I'm sorry. I had a. Uh, my computer was at the doctor's my computer office. Computer was at the doctor's office. No problem. I I'm sure uh, you can come up with something. Uh, Yes, that but you asked me to talk about hyper-local participation, which means? Jeez. No, my, yes, okay, the background story for everyone is that uh, um, given Professor Levanski is an expert of uh, participatory democracy, and we usually speak about uh, Europeans' level participatory democracy, I wanted to highlight how at a local level, maybe if there is a conjunction point between local level participatory initiatives uh, and uh, transnational politics maybe you can help us walking this line uh, between different uh, layers of participation and different uh, institutional layers uh, sure okay. thank you Virginia. I, I, I might have a few things to offer for to the discussion uh for my knowledge at least historically uh, citizen the role we're talking about I try to avoid the word participation because it's become so uh, in a regime, in a political regime that we want to consider truly democratic. Now, historically and in uh, political philosophy, when you talk about uh, participation, mainly it's at a level. I mean, the ancient poly Greek polis, or the medieval uh, cities in Italy, or uh, the experiences you had in uh, in local participation. It's just the way to consider it only as local, because the problem was basically numbers. Only small groups of people could talk in a constructive and uh, uh, informed, as you said before, a form informed way. Big numbers, you have an assembly, the dynamics change, and you know what happens in these 
large meeting, somebody talks, the others listen, it's open to manipulation and so on. So I think uh, participatory deliberation or deliberative participation, excuse me, has offered some answers to this problem in a big, large sized, modern, complex society. Uh, sampling uh, of uh, citizens uh, based on the principle that we are all equal in political rights. We're not identical. We don't have to be identical, but we are equal. This is an important point in our political rights. Uh, it offered the the, a way, participatory, del deliberative participation, excuse me, to incorporate knowledge, as I think uh, Martin German was, uh, was saying before, it's a learning process. And for example, John Stuart Mill in 1800 was already underlining the educational importance of participating. The only way you learn to participate is by doing it. There is no school, there's no textbooks, there's no professor. It can't be taught. It has to be learned by citizens by doing it. Of course, if you do this starting from your social experiences, uh, I'd like to quote Carol Pateman, who is a, a British American scholar, uh, besides writing important things on um, uh, the uh, gender issue, uh, but she also wrote a very fundamental book way back in the 1970, looks like a, a century ago, it's only half a century, when she brought back in the topic of participation and attracted our attention to the fact that citizens learn in their experiences. Where? In the family, at school, and the working place. Nobody talks about citizen participation on the job, where you work. Uh, and uh, if you never practice this in your other dimensions of your common everyday life as a citizen, how are you supposed to be suddenly wake up and become an active citizen who knows how to participate, that has all the skills and competences that this might require? So we should broaden perhaps our spectrum, not only at various levels from local to global, but also to various sectors, sections of our common everyday life, so to say. I hear almost no discussion on, on these aspects. The family might change, it might be more or less authoritarian, but that's because of social dynamics. Nobody discusses the roles of parents and sons and daughters. How about the workplace? Uh, very little democracy there too. Maybe the trade unions have a little bit of a say, but it's usually conflictual, antagonistic, and then they work out a deal. But it's not participating Perhaps there is uh, something in Germany that might be a beginning uh, trade union sitting in the uh, boards of uh, large firms, but it's very little. So this is one aspect. The other aspect is, as I was saying, the numbers and participatory democracy by sampling, by its methods, inclusive methods of structuring dialogue offer a lot. Many of you know all about this. But I must uh, put a warning there because I've seen this happen and I'll come down to the local now. I'm from Bologna, Italy, a city that is the red city of Italy, maybe of Europe. We had the Communist Party in power almost always since World War II and there's a lot of participation, which means a lot of talk about participation. But when it comes down to facts, the big decisions, citizens are actually excluded from the important decisions. We had a it's an ongoing conflict now in Bologna. It's about broadening the highway that goes around the city that collects north and southern Italy. Levels of pollution, I'm talking to our friends who are worried about the environment. The levels of pollution in Bologna, as in all northern Italy, are very high, especially in the winter. The damage to human health is uh, stated by the World Health Organization, but the reply is still more lanes to your highways, more traffic, more automobiles. So what the municipality did, it did a very small, hurried little process. It called it participation. It had all the external aspect of deliberative participation, little tables with the facilitators, everything very nice and cute, but the substance was not there. And the substance is what you mentioned before. So 
what's the real influence of these processes on the choices, the difficult choices we have to make as a society. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, political culture, even a region that is apparently very open like mine, is de facto very, very limited. Uh, one last mention, Virginia, if I have time, is the Tuscany experience. The, we have 20 regions in Italy, to make it simple. One of them is Tuscany. Um, and they passed a law in 2007, so it's uh, 13 years ago. Very innovative, inspired to the principles of uh, deliberative democracy. And uh, it had a number of features, among which an independent authority that had the role of guaranteeing the impartial, neutral character of partic local participatory processes. It put money on the table, so it was not only chat. And we did some, I was the first of those authorities for five years, and we did some 20 processes every year with that money, 700,000 euro per year. And, uh, and I tried to inject a strong dose of uh, deliberation into this process. It wasn't always easy, but I think it was quite innovative compared to what you usually do in Italy. Problem was, this is, I'm talking to a point that somebody mentioned before. Politicians don't, I think our, our Belgian friend, politicians don't want to cede power. They want to keep it tight. And that was where the conflict raised. They passed a law, but they didn't like the real implications of handing over a part of political decision-making power back to the citizens. So that's an interesting case we have in Italy I might be interested in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Levansky, also for the, um, I think when we use words like participatory democracy, uh, but in general, when we use words, we need to think about what they mean and if there is a shared kind of understanding of the meaning and probably another element of activism and transnational networks at a European level is that the meaning of a word and the sort of international in English that we use might create levels of uh, need to dialogue and, and come up with a common um, significance for, for things. Like for example, to me, the element of uh, uh, the official instruments compared to others, like uh, there is a big difference between doing a petition using a private platform. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't help to do a petition on change.org, but different than some petition to the European Action and Citizen Initiative with capital letters is different than uh, uh, petitioning uh, in general to the Commission. I think there is a uh, and one of the um, purposes of the Council is to try and deep dive in the in different instruments, the institutional ones and the less institutional ones, and uh, and see how they can work together towards similar goals. Uh, so we we have uh, with us Alain Denis. Welcome, Alain. Um, he is the founder of the place where we are, which is the oh. Salon of oh, Ireland, of the Salon of European Civic Organizations, which is a someone would say is a co-working, but is way beyond that. And uh, Alain is the author of, of a book about the future of Brussels, but also I learned yesterday uh, is part of a group working on a mapping of civic participation in the time of coronavirus crisis. So we, you have three different angles to bring out to the table, Alain. I think the Brussels angle is quite interesting uh, in terms of the future of the city for sustainability, environment, politics, and participation. But uh, feel free to share with you the angle that you feel more useful for, for this forum. So thank you, uh, Virginia. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be uh, and honored to be invited in your conversation. And I have to say a little hello to Marco Capato, because he may he may have forgotten, but we followed uh, lessons of Spanish about 20 years ago. That's quite a coincidence, like among all the reasons to be connected, that's a nice one. So, so, uh, so hello to him and hello to uh, all of you. Uh, indeed, uh, Virginia, you um, you alluded to the fact that uh, I have several hats. 
uh, not only in that conversation, but uh, in many, uh, many other places. Uh, indeed, um, I'm the founder of a think tank called Aula Magna, uh, reflecting on uh, the future and the identity of Brussels. And that is that group of uh, people uh, with people like Philippe Van Parijs, Eric Coren, etc. Um, that we, we published a, a book, uh, Demain Bruxelles, you know, with X S E L S to, to show the multi linguistic uh, character of the city. Um, a second capacity would be indeed the fact that we uh, we have uh, and, and you'll participate, in Virginia, in in one of them uh, next week on on you know the impact on civic organisations of the COVID nineteen crisis because clearly uh, it has disrupted uh, airline uh, you know traffic and airline industry, but no sector of human activity has been spared. You know, everybody is being impacted by this uh, terrible uh, crisis. Now, maybe the third capacity I I'd like to say a word uh, about is the fact that uh, I'm very active in the European neighborhood in, in Brussels, uh, as I lead a coalition of uh, people, uh, you know, financed by the real estate uh, people, you know, having big, big assets in the, uh, in the European quarter. Uh, trying to redynamize, rejuvenate, and change the image of the European quarter, which has not been a, a terrific uh, image for the last 30 years. But we all know if you are, uh, if you go to that uh, neighborhood from time to time, or maybe every day for some of you, you know that it's changing for for better. Um, in in that capacity, we have taken uh, two initiatives. Um, and uh, I'd like to briefly uh, describe those two initiatives. Uh, one is well known to Virginia. We, we created a kind of a co-working space, but directed at civic, pro-European, pan-European organizations. It's, it's in the Rue d'Arlon, 53, so in the very heart of the, uh, of the European quarter. And uh, it has already, on more than 1,000 square meters, uh, 15 associations, including uh, the Good Lobby, uh, ESIT, uh, JEP, UEF, you know, and, uh, and other people, Stand Up for Europe, etc. So a lot of uh, different, let's say, activist uh, organizations. But in addition to that, and that is uh, then more for the fall, we have imagined uh, a place 150 meters from there in the same So we are going to the dialogue between citizens of the European quarter neighborhood, citizens of Brussels in general, and then European citizens at large. And dialogue not among themselves, of course among themselves, but especially with the European institutions and the so-called European ecosystem. By that I mean the people not being civil servants, in the uh, EU institutions, but being all these people we know about and who are more numerous than the civil servants, as a matter of fact, in a two to three uh, ratio, I mean the lobbies, the lawyers, the trade associations, uh, the regions, uh, and, and uh, you name them. Um, and we will we'll do that in a place that will inaugurate physically when it's gonna be permitted to do so but it's going to be prepared by online and virtual conversations. And we intend to uh, inaugurate this, let's say, in October as a place where following a charter we have established, uh, determining the way conversations should be led and the type of format of these conversations, uh, where these dialogues could take place around, uh, let's say, uh, an open fire or around the table because in Europe, especially, we like uh, we like to eat. It's part of our uh, art of uh, living. Uh, but also in a little amphitheater, also around the radio studio, allowing people to, you know, record uh, interviews uh, to be podcasted, etc. So a lot of different activities that we are going to to launch. And obviously, this place will be open for everyone wanting 
to host a debate, organize a dialogue, etc. We won't rent the space, so you, you cannot say, I'm going to reserve for a whole day for a seminar and then you do whatever you please. No, it's going to be something where you will have to, to, to play by the rules of the house, okay? Uh, the, the place will be named Stam Europa. So Stam is a Dutch word. Don't forget that we are a bilingual city in, uh, in, uh, in Brussels. And you may have heard Belgian speaking about Stam Café. So Stam Café are the, the café, you know, the place where you have drinks, um, where people have their Stam. And Stam means it's exactly where you come from. So when you say Stam Europa, it means you, a Europe of the roots. Uh, no nationalistic roots for sure for Europe. So that's going to be the name, uh, the name of the place. And I would be delighted to further explain that in another circumstance, uh, what it's going to be um, in detail. Uh, but let me finish by saying that definitely we will try to establish this place as one of the places where the famous or infamous, uh, because there's still no agreement about it, but the famous conference on the future of Europe could be uh, played off. By that I mean there will be a lot of official organizations by the three EU institutions, including also the two smaller ones, Regions and Economic and Social Committee, but we, we can uh, be afraid of the fact that these are going to be very, very formal you know, organizations, we know that, and we want to uh, be in the position to be endorsed and, and labelized by these institutions as a place where alternative debates can take place, but still recognized as being part of the process by the five EU uh, institutions. Kind of an off place, like, you know, the theater festival in, uh, in Avignon in France, you've got the on festival and then the off festival, and we would be an off um, uh, place. So more about that later on, uh, if people are interested. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, Alain. And uh, maybe you could host one of the next Council some participatory democracy since we are the, I mean, self-convocated fourth or sixth body of the European institution. The whole idea is to have a space for citizens to discuss participatory democracy as such, so maybe why not? Let's talk. Together. Let's talk. Um, so we have some time before the more local uh, administrators um, and the end of the, of the panel. I would like to ask Marco Caffato maybe to, unless someone else wants to, to speak, but uh, uh, the approach that the top global warming European citizen initiative has uh, we, we use the expression creative commons type of approach and I think Marco can uh, can work us a bit about the instrument of European citizen initiative but mm -hmm. also how this campaign can be used by multiple organizations and how it differentiates a participatory democracy campaign from there is a microphone um, how sorry how a participatory democracy initiative is different from a one political party initiative the the, the key word is probably cooperation okay. but please marco walk us through, through this okay thank you very much virginia first of all uh, mi saludos a alain espero que tu español eh, um, progresado uh, mucho más que eh, mi eh? okay um, and uh, and uh, and thank you, Helen, for uh, uh, hosting us. Uh, and um, congratulations for your project because I think that uh, also physical proximity can be important in uh, sharing experiences. Uh, of course, uh, combined with the uh, old modern web tools, but uh, um, I think you had a bright idea, and I hope. Uh, uh, the best success to it, uh, to us, because we consider uh, as humans uh, a part of it. Trying to answer uh, to the point that Virginia was making, um, I, I would like to say something before 
on the relationship between representative democracy and participatory democracy uh, because uh, I think we should never forget uh, a sort of structural handicap or disadvantage that participatory democracy and direct democracy tools are suffering compared to representative democracy. Representative democracy is something on which national governments are investing plenty of money, of public money. The European Union is investing on representative democracy plenty of money. Um, tens of millions of euros to let people know, for example, uh, about election day in Europe and hundreds of millions of euro uh, spent in order to run the parliament, run the parliament buildings in Brussels, in Strasbourg, uh, in Luxembourg, uh, translate documents, uh, interpreters, interpreters uh, paying the member of parliament. So representative democracies is something on which national governments are investing a lot of money. Rightly so. I agree with that. I'm not against. Uh, participatory democracy tools um, sometimes we are taking for granted that citizens have to pay for it. Uh, yes, of course, um, institution can organize, I don't know, the ballot or some referendum or can, can provide some services, but basically citizens, they should do on their own and they should pay the cost, even to inform the people. And this is what, are, what leads to European citizen initiatives. European citizen, citizen initiatives are not known by European citizens. There is no a service of public information in order to let the people know uh, about uh, which kind of European citizen, which uh, citizen, European citizen initiatives are active currently, for example. Uh, nobody knows about it. Uh, I think that maybe one out of 100 people more or less could know about what a European citizen initiative is. So uh, we have, and the goal of this uh, council, I think, should also be, we have to fill a gap, a gap of information, a gap of attention, maybe also a gap of investment that all the deliberatory, participatory or direct democracy tools are suffering compared to representative democracy in order to complement it. So I'm not, uh, I'm not presenting a thing as an alternative to the other, but complementary. And this brings us to the point of, for example, the campaign that we are running, uh, stopglobalwarming.eu, in order to establish a European carbon pricing, a common European carbon pricing, uh, in order to uh, contrast climate change, which is something supported by 27 Nobel laureates and is something that uh, I wouldn't say the unanimity, but the vast majority of uh, scientific community, community and academics is agreeing as uh, crucial in order to reduce CO2 emissions and uh, also preserve free market and free market uh, approach. Um, so th this is something that I'm convinced that if uh, even a minority of European citizens would know that th there is this opportunity, we would not have difficulties in uh, reaching uh, 1 million signatures. As Virginia was, said, was saying before, the advantage 
in activating this tool compared to following just the parliamentary path is that political parties are in a structural competition and paradoxically uh, the more similar another political party is to my organization to my organization the more the competition is uh, hard because we are competing for the same um, part of the electorate so there is a competition among pro-european political parties there is competition among pro-environment uh, political party uh, and so so on and so far and the opposite of course is also true activating a tool of participatory democracy allows to uh, aggregate different forces that remain maybe also in competition on many many aspects but that could be united in the same effort this is why we built um, a communication campaign uh, and uh, um, a, a, a project that is not um, property of a specific organization uh, you know if you, if you sign a european citizen initiative signatures personal data cannot be used by the organizers so this initiative is not done to create a huge mailing list to make uh, fundraising activities of course we are more than happy if someone is giving us uh, his personal data and also uh, gives us some money to run the campaign but uh, the campaign is conceived uh, in a way that any kind of organization any kind of or any individual any political party any anyone around europe can take the initiative this is why virginia was uh, was uh, talking about creative commons every and each one can take the initiatives and using as they want uh, on their website on uh, their social media with their language with their campaign uh, without being obliged to structured organization under the same communication plan um, so uh, this is a uh, i think something that could be important especially for our uh, uh, let's say local environment uh, activist group uh, because they can go on with their own initiatives of course and to add to use their own local initiative to add this european initiative to enrich in a way the local initiative with a wider scope linking uh, your own local initiative to uh, a wider european vision uh, of uh, shifting taxation from labor for example to uh, the the pollution or the consumption of natural resources uh, thank you very much Virginia. thank you very much thank you marco uh, you raised the attention of chiara gastaldi who wanted to we cannot hello. hear you virginia hello hello oh, oh sorry no problem uh, we have chiara gastaldi who wanted to add something to what we were discussing so go on chiara Welcome. Yes, thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Um, so um, I I am particularly interested in this topic, and also as uh, Lorenzo mentioned before, like on one hand, uh, um, as Marco Capato just said, um, there there is a lack of um, information through uh, through the government and um, like public information about um, European citizen initiative. 
But on the other hand, there are a lot of uh, local uh, activist groups, and since today we are talking about sustainability, uh, I'm particular part of Extinction Rebellion. Um, and these groups, or like Fridays for Future and other groups, bring a lot of people in the streets for climate change, and it looks like these people, in theory, are supposed then to support this kind of initiatives when they're given the chance, because if you make a strike uh, for stopping climate change, then you should vote for these initiatives that uh, they support it, but apparently these people don't know it. And uh, that's also my direct experience, which is uh, I'm a member of Extinction Rebellion, but in Switzerland, because that's where I live, I'm an Italian citizen. Um, I try to promote the initiative uh, Stop, Global Mor Stop Global Warming initiative from uh, Luca Cosciani Association uh, by trying to contact Extinction Rebellion in Italy and Fridays for Future in Italy. What uh, came out is that, uh, well, some, some just didn't reply to me. Uh, some people t told me we promoted this initiative within our own information means, which means very few people actually got in touch. I don't know why they don't promote it publicly. Um, and finally, the answer from Fridays for Future was they had their own initiative, which was a, a similar, but maybe uh, even more ambitious. And so they will now promote another initiative public because it's so hard to gain signatures. So my question is, uh, what can we do? So, I mean, as an activist, what would be interesting for me is to find a way and maybe people to coordinate different groups of activists at this level, because it's great to make a strike and show how many, how many people care about environment. But at the end, we have to use democratic means to actually make uh, things work in practice. So. How can we uh, convey all these efforts into a real initiative like this one, which I think could be a great starting point? And how can we use the, the nets of activism to promote it publicly and not just privately, which I think it's a bit too little. Uh, thank you, Chiara. My personal answer is that um, the only way to overcome um, this kind of skepticism is to bring results in a way so, so as far as we will be able to involve um, citizens signing the petitions um, social media influencers uh, organization then there will be an effet boule de neige uh, i don't know how it's called in english um, but uh, one thing can bring the other so uh, i wouldn't blame uh, let's say a kind of instinctual tendency of organization to protect and also is uh, uh, is also motivated in a way um, me too um, if an organization that I don't know is proposing something to me at the beginning, I want to see how serious they are. Uh, they, the fact that they don't want just to use my network to promote their own uh, agenda. And this, uh, this kind of subtle uh, competition for political parties is structural and impossible to overcome for ngos is uh, by effect is not that structural and it can be uh, overcome but you need to be to build trust so this is why uh, we just don't have to give up we have to involve more people in order to increase the credibility of the initiatives we have to go on with this method that Virginia was also presenting of uh, creative common initiatives. So to make clear that we are not proposing to uh, Extinction Rebellion or Fridays for Future to jump in our organization, but just to use the campaign for uh, their own campaign. And yeah, at, at the end, not everybody will be convinced. Uh, we cannot pretend that everybody will agree. Somebody could uh, consider the goal, the goals not radical enough or not ambitious enough. Other could consider too ambitious 
or to write uh, initiative to to cope the, with the problem. Another way to build trust is also to support initiatives that are coming from elsewhere. So not just to pretend that other organizations are supporting our own initiative, but also to study and to support initiatives that are invented by others. This can help in building mutual trust and in increasing the synergic effort. And for example, uh, having, as Alain Denis presented before, um, some uh, sites, some places, some physical and local places, or also virtual places, where experiences are shared, is exactly what helps in building this uh, trust uh, that you cannot build just uh, in one day. You need time to build up. So uh, now we had the, the, the news the European Commission uh, has postponed the deadline for collecting signatures uh, because of the coronavirus crisis to more uh, six months more. So we have some some time more to build this trust, uh, and I think we can succeed in this uh, uh, purpose. Thank you. Uh, that's great. I just want to add uh, that's great. And um, as I said, I will keep on trying to promote it within uh, the network uh, of people I know directly in activism. But also, um, what I was surprised about is that, I mean, usually, um, I don't extinction rebellion just because it's a bit bigger in Lausanne compared to Fridays for Future, uh, but they usually support each other. Nevertheless, uh, I didn't know about the uh, initiative of Fridays for Future. This tell us how much, how much is hard to make people know about this kind of initiative because even people that actively look for it find it hard to find all of them, or the one that could be interesting. So I think this is really something uh, this could be worth uh, understanding better. I think on this there is an element, uh, one is about the instrument, the European Citizen Initiative, and one is about how activism is organized, particularly transnationally, and probably the two things go together in my opinion. So from the European Citizen Initiative side, and I repeat it because maybe sometimes it's easy to leave things for granted, so for us on the panel, but also for who is following on the social media channel. So the European Citizen Initiative with capital letters is a uh, official petition to the European Commission that needs to reach one million signatures in a one year time frame in the competencies of the Commission to suggest a policy proposal. If the one million signatures are collected in EU member states, then the Commission consider the proposal and eventually triggers the legislative process. This is really in a nutshell, it's a bit more complex than that, but just to tell everyone what it is, I think it's stepping stone. And in regards to what Chiara was saying, I think the fact that people don't know what is a European Citizen Initiative, so you might read it, and if you read it quickly, it's called European Citizen Initiative, it doesn't have a wording that reminds you about a official legislative process uh, or like a referendum means referendum, it's a bit more clear, while the softening of the words doesn't help to make this officiality element, which is I think one of the pillars for convincing others to support the initiative because it's official, because it talks to the institution, it sounds like another petition or something like that. So I think this element of information. I think the second element is uh, the fact that now it's different, but having a pan-European political debate, dialogue, confrontation, I mean, I, th I think one of the reasons why we set up the Council on Participatory Democracy is that uh, it's an opportunity to discuss
elements so there are the like, ambiente uh, practice for future and to spread it via social as soon as possible. Thank you, Laria. Thank you very much. And uh, I see we have uh, Eleonora De Maio, who is the Councillor for Culture and Tourism in the um, Municipality of Naples. Welcome, Eleonora. Hi. Hi, hello. Uh, welcome. Hi, it's okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, are you comfortable okay. in English? Do you prefer to do it? Like, uh, we are ready for listening about uh, the municipality of Naples and the environment. Yes, but, but I'm trying the chat. So, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, no, I have already joined the chat. So, if you can recap me uh, yeah. what you were speaking about. Of course. Thank you. You're welcome, and no problem. So um, we we started the conversation starting to think about uh, um, participatory democracy instruments at a local level. Um, then we shared some experiences, uh, uh, mainly about uh, uh, Montenegro, Poland, uh, uh, Italy, and Europe uh, with the Stop Global Warming EU initiative. Um, Alain Denis described uh, how in Brussels. Uh, a group of private stakeholders uh, uh, is trying to build a hub for civic participation. And what we would like to ask you is if you want to share with us some experiences of the municipality of uh, Naples around uh, citizens' participation and citizens' involvement in deliberative processes, uh, but also um, your view about environmental and sustainability policies at a local level i mean naples is uh, one of the biggest cities in europe i guess but <laughs> it's still local so your take on the topic of civic participation and uh, sustainability based on the perspective that you want to choose okay thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to all of you um i just want to tell you i think two different things one is uh, uh, focused on uh, this uh, moment of uh, coronavirus uh, uh, situation and so uh, I think this big uh, fight that is um, uh, that we are living uh, as uh, uh, deputy mayors and uh, the cities in, uh, in with the governments of single uh, nations because uh, you know in this uh, difficult moment we have a, a big big economic crisis because of the um, coronavirus and all the effects of corona coronavirus on our economy and so our cities our municipalities are in a very very big difficulties so in this moment there is a really really strange situation that we are uh, really uh, close to all the social movements all the workers all the artists for example that now are stopping because of the coronavirus and so no shows uh, no public uh, uh, shows and so no theater no cinema and so we are living together with this crisis it's strange because we are living uh, like uh, on the same barricade the mayors uh, councillors uh, and the people of the cities uh, and on the other side uh, on the other um, part of the barricade we have in this moment uh, really far away from us uh, unfortunately because uh, uh, we'd like to have uh, um, in this moment, the uh, government closer to us, but we have a, a lot of problems with uh, with, the, uh, with the, the the policies that they are um, uh, pushing in this uh, in these moments. But we are living a big difficulties, a big situation because uh, uh, cities in general. I'm uh, speaking about all Italian cities, not only Naples, but cities in general are going to the. One second, because I think there is a problem with your connection. We lost you. I think we lost Eleonora. Hello, hello. Failure. Can you hear us? The people. Um, we cannot. I I am.
primero in a city of uh, south of Italy. So I think that the economic crisis in my territory, my city, this is uh, deeper. Yeah? We cannot hear you. I think it's about the Wi Fi connection or the internet connection. I can't can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Hey. Can someone else try to speak, please? Lorenzo, can you speak? Say something? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. You. I don't know. Apparently, ah, oh, okay, okay, okay. We had problem by hearing you. Uh, okay. Previously, maybe now the connection seems to be a bit. No, the connection doesn't seem to be very good. But I, now? Maybe. I will. Not. Let's try again. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. No, the connection is not good. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay. I, can, I can email you maybe okay. and send you a phone number. You okay. can also call by may phone. Maybe it will be better than a true internet. May may Maybe maybe here is better. Yeah, it seems to be maybe better. Here is better. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm out of the window. <laughs> I'm out of the window. So it must be we, better. We lost quite a lot, like four good minutes of what you were saying. Okay, I try to sum. Okay, I try to summarize. I just want to join with you that in I'm a deputy mayor of a southern city in Europe, and now we are living all the effects of the economic crisis on the cities and on all the different zones and the regions of Europe. In this situation, we are living now the paradox that mayors and deputy mayors, councillors are really close to the social movements, artists, workers that are living all the effects of and poverty of. Um, all the people that now is are not working because of the coronavirus uh, uh, effects. So in this moment, we are uh, experimenting like a um, participatory democracy that is uh, forced because of the coronavirus. And we are in the squares uh, all together. We are fighting with the national government to have more money for cities and for people. So uh, this is one of the, of the of the thing I want to join with you, and the other aspect is uh, connected to the environmental sustainability, and what you asked me on the, the second part of your uh, of your question. Um, of course, you know that uh, I live in the, this uh, part of Europe that is uh, named this called from a journalist and newspapers Terra di Fuochi, uh, fires uh, land lands. Yes, it is a, a place that is full of, of environment, environment um, um, that is that came from uh, uh, the. Um, waste, the legal waste of the northern factories, not, on, not only northern factories, also, also factories of our, uh, of our region, of our south of Italy, but in general, illegal uh, waste and toxic waste. And we have, the, during these 30 years, an increasing of cancers, an increasing, increasing of uh, um, pathologies connected to the environmental disaster. Uh, we have, a, uh, because of this, we have a really strong environmental uh, justice movement. Uh, every day, uh, there is a demonstration against the, the local uh, regional government and against the national uh, government, uh, European government. I think all, uh, I, I mean, all the different levels, institutional levels, because uh, uh, we need something like uh, um, a big, new big project, new big uh, idea, new, new big uh, uh, project uh, of uh, uh, sustainability and uh, uh, um, green idea of our uh, landscape and our uh, um, region, because uh, at, at the, in this moment, the, we have another Pan pandemic and another pandemic situation that is called the effects of uh, environmental disaster on uh, our uh, region that is Campania and the fire uh, uh, land, the Terra di Fuji. May I say a few words to you have connect? To. Uh, Okay, in connection with what Leonardo was saying, is that um, we are currently with Marco Capato and the Movement Humans, but many other uh, movements and associations are joining this campaign. We are running an ECI, which is a European Citizens Initiative. It's called the Stop Global Warming. And we are collecting, uh, we have to collect one million signatures uh, 
uh, to submit an official uh, proposal to the European Commission to introduce uh, a carbon pricing. So it would be a way for Europe to put a minimal price on carbon and tax the CO2 emissions. It's something concrete that we can do against uh, uh, climate change. And one of the reasons uh, for which we convened this uh, meeting, apart from knowing more about all the local experiences uh, on environmental policies, uh, one of the reasons is to receive support from uh, municipalities, uh, local uh, activists and uh, also local administrators uh, to support this campaign. It would be a strong message if um, on the 5th of June, which is, will be the the day of environment um, on the social media we might have a, a, a huge campaign uh, of politicians but also influencers and other um, people around Europe uh, showing uh, the logo of Stock Global Warming and saying that uh, let, letting no to European citizens they can, they can sign this initiative. It would be a way to start a bottom-up process actually uh, for a concrete action uh, for, against climate change. So since many other cities are saying that they will join this mobilization, the mayor of Palermo, uh, but also the mayor of Dublin, and uh, uh, we are in touch with Valencia and many other cities, of course we will be very happy to uh, keep in touch with you and see if we might have uh, support also from Naples. Not to put you on the spot, uh, Councillor De Maio. <laughs> okay, I, um, so we have one last discussant that is supposed to join us, who is Lorenzo Lipparini. I wrote him, but he was supposed to already be with us, but he's not, so I, I'm checking if he will make it. And. Uh, uh, in the meantime, maybe we can take some time. Uh, I know I don't want to make it compulsory as a round of table, but maybe the people that didn't speak yet, or anyone, if you want to share some uh, thoughts on the things that we discussed today, the perspective, any idea, or, I mean, let's, let's have some general moment uh, to build on, on what we discussed. Uh, you can uh, just speak. We are not that many, so. all very shy so, um, okay i just need to check um i can't both be happy with you and check with miss parini so if someone wants to say something i will try and give a call to lorenzo um, while virginia is uh, speaking uh, trying to find lorenzo uh, i just um, would propose that uh, we could share also in a written form uh, because we already organized in December a, a conference on citizen assembly and participatory democracy experiment. Um, I'm sure that are already existing some uh, database where information are collected about what is happening around Europe on participatory democracy. So we don't have to invent something new if, uh, if this does already exist, but it would be very interesting to, uh, to collect also in a, in a written form uh, the kind of experiences on uh, uh, participatory initiatives around Europe. So I think it's important not to consider this meeting as uh, exhaustive of uh, of, um, of the the issue but just uh, uh, the the building of a platform in which uh, um, different experiences can be shared not only from uh, uh, an institutional point of view 
to understand what is possible to do in Montenegro, what is possible to do in Belgium, what is possible to do in Naples, what is possible to do in the Brussels region and so on, uh, but also to share the specific experiences also as a communication campaign, obstacles that are encountered. So uh, if, uh, if Lorenzo is not coming and if there will not be uh, other speakers, I just propose uh, to keep on with the current uh, um, mission of this platform of the Council on Participatory Democracy to share experiences and best, best practices also beyond what is uh, discussed uh, orally, but orally even with a more systematic uh, written contribution. Thank you. Yes, to that effect, I've just shared in the chat the Fearless Cities yeah. Network. So it's just fearlesscities.com. And it does uh, exactly what you propose. It does bundle or give a platform for uh, participatory local or regional initiatives, if I'm not mistaken, um, on a map. So it's quite handy. Thank you, Pepin. And I'm also sharing the link of another organization, which is called Democracy International. Um, they, they, they were among the participants in last week. We will have a mapping as well of uh, uh, participatory democracy experiences. And I think Professor Levansky, that was with us earlier, works also on a mapping of initiatives. So I think uh, the more we connect knowledge, the, the better it is. Um, as we go toward the conclusion, um, I just summarize, uh, I just to draw some conclusion and to summarize how this council works. So um, we do have weekly meetings every Thursday for the next couple of uh, next weeks. We are also focusing quite a lot on stopglobalwarming.eu. So the meeting is usually split in between a conversation about the instruments and a bit of a shorter version of what we do in the monthly meetings and um, uh, campaign specifically. It's also a good opportunity to bring along your own campaigns and initiative and maybe discuss together how we can transform it democratically using official instruments uh, and again, share the best practices and knowledge. Um, and uh, most likely the next meeting will be in one month from now, the, the extended one. And you all have our email addresses and my email addresses. So if you have any idea on how the format can be improved uh, or how we can uh, tackle a specific topic in a different way, um, it's an experiment. So it's not a, uh, something that has a set form. So the first time we worked on the You Can Do It petition, the second time it was more about uh, information and designing citizen assemblies. And this time is more on the local level. So the idea is to keep this coming in in different ways but having a um, an open space for for people to learn share and uh, uh, work together um, the recordings will be available uh, in the next days on the youtube channel with the usual index uh, that we have and if you want to contribute to the um, uh, stop global warming.io initiative you can send us a message specific for that and we can share all the info but be honest, I will share it with you also proactively in the next hours in any case. Um, thanks everyone who joined and I hope it was uh, helpful for me, it was super interesting personally and uh, have a great uh, Thursday evening and uh, fun, hopefully. Have a good uh, weekend, bye. Bye bye. Bye, thanks everyone. Bye, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Um, thank you. We, Bye. Can we leave this room open to hang out? Uh, yes, if you want. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. The uh, the 6 p.m. meeting is still happening today, correct? Um, I didn't cancel it, but yeah, no, I think it's not uh, because we had the three hours and it will be more or less the the same so i will keep it open if someone will join but uh, i don't think we're having the 6 p.m meeting like it's uh, too much <laughs> okay well then
Cool, thanks Cesare. So, um, grazie ragazzi, bye bye, ciao. Ciao Marco. Bye. Bye. Thank you.